It's the spring collection that everyone will be talking about. What's your tarty? The show the stars are queuing to be a part of. Do you want a drink? You're all right. Don't try and It's very difficult. It's very difficult. I can never really see what it is you actually do. <laughs> I PR things. number one client. She tells everyone that. Absolutely Fabulous returns to BBC One on Thursday the 30th of March. Now the news with Peter Sissons. It's nine o'clock. President Clinton calls on Sinn Féin and the IRA to start talking about getting rid of the guns. He admits tensions with Britain over the Adams visit but says he and John Major share the same goals. West Country trawlermen vent their anger on the fisheries minister over concessions to Spain. And Mansell's comeback with McLaren must wait while they rebuild the car to fit him in. Good evening. President Clinton, playing host in Washington to Gerry Adams, today acknowledged Britain's anger at the visit and publicly put the pressure on Sinn Féin to start talks about dismantling the IRA armory. Mr Clinton urged Sinn Féin to take the next step to peace. They must, he said, make a generous gesture themselves in their own way. Mr Clinton paid tribute to John Major's role in the peace process, underlined the deep relationship with Britain and said that their objectives were the same. During the, during the day, Mr Adams himself foresaw talks with British ministers sooner rather than later. The White House has a traditionally green flavour on St Patrick's Day. The Irish Prime Minister was President Clinton's guest there today, the formal part of the occasion to present him with a bowl of shamrock. But the Northern Ireland peace process, its present state, and the row between Washington and London over Gerry Adams' visit here were the political agenda. And the President made his only public comments this week about that agenda. They were among his strongest ever, and some were clearly directed at groups like Sinn Féin. I call on all those who still resort to violence to end the beatings, the intimidations, the shootings. To those who have laid down their arms, I ask you now to take the next step and began to seriously discuss getting rid of these weapons so they can never be used again and violence will never again return to the land. I welcome the statement by Sinn Féin reiterating its readiness to include the issue of weapons in the talks with the British government. It must be included and progress must be made. He said the next step in decommissioning couldn't come soon enough for him. And there is even more of the language that's just what Downing Street wants to hear. We may differ from time to time about the specific actions that each would take. But our goal is the same. And I think we all have to recognize the, the risks that Prime Minister Major has taken for peace within the context of, in which he must operate. So uh, I look forward to having a chance to visit with him in the next couple of days about this. And I'm basically very positive about it. Uh, Afterwards, John Bruton, too, was seeing the positive, saying that the actions over the last 10 days of the US government had helped engineer a convergence of position between the British government and Sinn Féin on the possibility of a ministerial meeting. I believe there are serious moves being made on both sides to bring that desirable result about. I believe the British government are making a major effort to meet uh, the Sinn Féin concerns and also, I believe, particularly as a result of the influence of the US administration, Sinn Féin is making a serious effort now to meet the British requirements. And Gerry Adams, addressing the National Press Club in Washington, suggested very strongly that a meeting between his party and a junior minister was closer than expected. I am pleased, therefore, to announce that we have moved to a discussion of the agendas for meetings between Sinn Féin and British ministers. These meetings will take place sooner rather than later, and this is my firm conviction. Gerry Adams will be going to the White House this evening, and so too will a party which represents a loyalist paramilitary group, not the easiest of social mixes. It makes me feel decidedly uncomfortable. I have no particular wish to be in the same room as Gerry Adams. Uh, in a time of conflict, uh, we're sworn enemies. Uh, in a time of peace, 
uh, that remains to be the same. Uh, I'm here to do a job, and I'm not going to let Jerry Ann stop me from doing it. Irish Americans are celebrating St. Patrick's Day more than the Irish do themselves. And despite all the talk of agreement and reconciliation, to many here, there's still only one acceptable outcome. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Washington. Earlier, Gerry Adams accused the British government of dirty tricks over the bomb found last night in Newry. The IRA has denied planting it and Sinn Féin claimed so-called British agents were responsible. The Northern Ireland Secretary Patrick Mayhew said the incident emphasised the need for the decommissioning of weapons by all terrorist groups in Northern Ireland. No one needs reminding here that guns and explosives are still widely in circulation. A small Semtex bomb partially exploded in Newry last night, underlining just that. Jerry Adams denied IRA involvement, blaming dirty tricks by the British, but the Northern Ireland Secretary said the incident showed the need for progress on the decommissioning of arms. Before they could sit down, so far as the British government is concerned, and take part in substantive political talks, there would have to have been a decommissioning of arms signifying the beginning of a process. And so, if it's going to signify that, it's got to be significant. These are some of the weapons the government want handed over or destroyed, part of the IRA's arsenal paraded in their own propaganda video. The IRA is believed to have up to 10 heavy machine guns, more than two tonnes of Semtex, and around 700 assault rifles. Less is known about loyalist armouries. Caches like these have been found. It's thought they've more than a thousand guns. Security experts believe getting the terrorists to give this up, even in stages, is fraught with difficulty. You have to convince the sets of paramilitaries that it's something that should be done and must be done. You then have to hope that uh, they can convince all their people and that the materials will be handed over in a fashion that means they can be verified. You also have to hope that, what, from what you know of what they've got, that there hasn't been anything more added to them in the meantime. It's inconceivable the IRA would accept the symbolism of giving weapons direct to the RUC or British government. Any handover is more likely in the Irish Republic. A third party has even been suggested. Major General Lewis Mackenzie, a veteran of Bosnia and Nicaragua, is one name already mooted. He says the difficulties overseeing the demilitarization in Nicaragua were obvious. Trouble was, the weapons that were handed in were pretty low on the quality line. I mean, they were the rusty ones and the you know, wormholes in the stocks from being buried. It certainly didn't take a brain surgeon to know that the best stuff was kept somewhere else for, for later date. Even if decommissioning happens, it's unlikely to cover the multitude of homemade devices the terrorists have developed, from fertilizer bombs to incendiary devices. Decommissioning will only ever be part of the story because in the history of Irish politics, people have always gone back to making their own homemade weapons where they don't have other weapons. And that potential will always remain here. The impasse on decommissioning remains that the government won't talk to Sinn Féin until some arms are handed over, while Sinn Féin say they'll only discuss the issue once wider talks begin. That's the immediate problem to be overcome, even before the many practical difficulties of implementing this are addressed. Matthew and Reddy Waller, BBC News, Belfast. The Fisheries Minister Michael Jack has been pelted with flour by angry trawlermen in Plymouth. Smoke bombs were also thrown by fishermen who were protesting at a European ruling that will allow Spanish vessels to fish for cod, prawn and hake in the so-called Irish box from January next year. The minister's car swept into Plymouth's new fish market. For Mr Jack, it was like going into the lion's den. Banners displayed the concern felt by many fishermen about Spanish entry into the so-called Irish box and continued membership of the common fisheries policy. Mr Jack was barely out of the car when he was embroiled in an argument with a fisherman. Well, you are you are rep in a court, right over, over well, the side, right? No, 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 it's just here, here now. You are our representative in Europe. Correct me if I'm Within wrong, minutes, the fishermen had barricaded the entrance to the quay, and then they let off air-sea rescue flares. There was no mood to compromise. Michael Jack's got more respect for the Spanish fishermen than he's got for the English. He's just <laughs> taken the side of another country instead of us. The Spanish don't abide by the rules. 
Uh, the French laugh at them. I mean, everybody laughs at the British because we buy by the rules and we get stuck with them. An hour later, the minister was again out, and again he was trying to reason with fishermen. But this was their response. More smoke bombs. Then an attack with flour. He tried to make his getaway by car, but immediately he ran against a roadblock. There was now only one alternative. He had to leave on foot, but not all fishermen agreed with the demonstrators' tactics. I don't think he did anything for the debate at all. I don't think it helped in any way. It's, uh, it was a demonstration which, to be quite honest, uh, was understandable, but I don't think it probably helped. A car was waiting for Mr. Jack on the other side of the fish market, and certainly this will be one trip he'll never forget. Stephen Cape, BBC News, Plymouth. Iraq is reported to have seized two Americans who crossed into its territory from Kuwait by mistake. They're said to be two civilians working for a contracting firm. United Nations observers are trying to ensure their safety. The Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister David Meller is tonight fighting a move by members of his local party to deselect him before the next election. Members of the party in Putney in south-west London are discussing whether they want a new parliamentary candidate following criticism of Mr Meller's private life. David Meller, no stranger to the news media pack, was ready with an assured response as he arrived to face his critics. Been inundated with messages of support and uh, so I shall put my case to the meeting and I will come out and tell you all about it after. But the arguing over his future had begun well before he reached the meeting when the constituency chairwoman Alexis Elliott confronted Donald Mackenzie, the organiser of the motion which calls on the MP to stand down. Well, I would like to say, as, I would like to say, as chairman of this association, Mr. Mackenzie here is totally and absolutely out of order. I feel I am representative of a lot of people in Putney who consider that David Miller will not win the next election. As such, we should replace him. A succession of damaging headlines over his extramarital affairs have dogged Mr. Miller and provoked criticism in the constituency of his private life. His lucrative career in the last few years as a broadcaster and consultant has also caused unease. In the latest register of members' interests, where all MPs must declare their business activities, Mr. Meller lists 11 consultancies. Companies like British Aerospace, accountants Ernst & Young, and public relations advisors Shandwick are just some of the firms Mr. Meller works for. But he does have support out in the streets of Putney. Just because of his own personal life doesn't shouldn't reflect really on what he does for the community and what he does for Putney. I'd I'd try to have him myself. So I'm a Labour <laughs> man, but I mean if I have to have him, I would try to have him because he gets things done. He's a rotten husband, but I thought he was a good MP. Judging by the way constituency party workers have been rallying to David Meller's cause, it does seem likely that he will survive. But there are misgivings within the Tory party as to whether he'll be able to hold the seat at a general election. Nicholas Jones, BBC News. Ronnie Cray, the notorious gangland leader, has died of a heart attack at the age of 61. He and his twin brother Reggie controlled organised crime in the East End of London in the 60s. Both were jailed for life in 1969 after being convicted of murder. Ronnie Cray was let out of Broadmoor in the early 80s to attend his mother's funeral. It's thought he could now be buried in the same cemetery, a funeral likely to bring much of London's East End to a standstill. The notorious gangster collapsed at Broadmoor Hospital on Wednesday. He died this morning after being transferred to another hospital in Slough. Born in 1933, Ronnie and his twin brother Reggie started out as boxers. They became the most feared of London's gang leaders. Ronnie was the violent, dominant partner. Their extensive protection racket, known as The Firm, extorted money from shopkeepers, enabling the twins to enjoy the high life. Desperate for fame, they cultivated the world of show business and the media. The sharp suits, the malevolence, creating a lasting image of the East End gangster. In the mid-60s, they were charged with demanding money with menaces, but they were acquitted. How much has this trial cost you? It's cost us roughly £8,000. And how do you feel about that? I don't suppose anyone likes the idea of spending that money for no reason at all, you know. Does it leave you broke, or how does it, it leave It doesn't you? leave us broke, but at the same time, it's a lot of money to have to pay out when money's innocent.
Ronnie held court in his front room in Bethnal Green, controlling West End protection, masterminding swindles, ordering killings over cups of tea. It was at the Blind Beggar pub in Whitechapel that Ronnie himself shot dead a rival, George Cornell. For that and the murder of Jack the Hat McVitie by Reggie, the pair were jailed in 1969. Today, at the Blind Beggar, some of their closest friends were mourning the end of an East End era. Some defended Ronnie Cray. Well, they were good guys. They were good gangsters, if you want to use such a word. They wouldn't harm women or children. They were untouchable. But for the policemen who finally caught up with the Crays, they were far from glamorous heroes. There's no question about what prevented witnesses giving evidence to suggest that the Crays were involved, and that was terror. Just absolute fear and terror. Fascination with the craze culminated in a film of their lives. But did the spirit of the 60s contribute to the cult? Today's criminals aren't seen as larger than life. But twins were very unusual criminals. They were criminals, but they were also celebrity criminals. And you don't get many of them. And they really knew how to pursue celebrity. Ronnie Cray was homosexual and a paranoid schizophrenic. Serving at least 30 years, his mental condition made it unlikely he would ever have been released. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News. A teenage boy has been killed and seven of his friends injured after a tree blew down in gale force winds in West Sussex. The boys who were sheltering in a shed were in the grounds of their school when the accident happened. Black market guns are being bought by Scotland's largest police force to stop them falling into the hands of criminals. The Chief Constable of Strathclyde says he's responding to the growing use of weapons during robberies, but some officers don't like the idea. A ban on deer hunting imposed by Somerset County Council on the Quantock Hills has been ruled unlawful by the Court of Appeal. The judges ended a two-year legal battle between the council and local hunt groups, saying the council was wrong to take into account their own moral views as to the ethics of hunting. New research suggests that babies are five times more at risk of cot death if both their parents smoke. The study also says cot deaths are not caused by toxic gases from mattresses. After claims made in ITV's The Cook Report last year, many retailers stopped selling certain mattresses. Claims by The Cook Report that babies could be poisoned by their mattresses provoked intense concern. The BBC programme QED asked the scientist involved, Barry Richardson, to repeat his findings. He claimed a fire retardant, antimony, used in PVC covers, could react with warmth and fluid from babies to produce a fungus, which can release a lethal gas. In tests on 19 mattresses, Mr. Richardson said he found the fungus in nearly all of them, and the lethal gas in several. But tests by scientists for QED at Birkbeck College found no lethal gases, and just two of the mattresses infected with the fungus. On the basis of the tests that we've carried out, um, there's no evidence at the moment to support um, Mr. Richardson's theory that uh, antimony is being liberated in the gaseous form from mattresses. At the time of the Cook report, the chief medical officer called its research limited, inadequate and flawed. Earlier this week, researchers in Glasgow rejected a link between antimony in mattresses and cot death. And a report in this week's Lancet reached the same conclusion. But the Cook Report scientist stands by his findings. I've had no reason to change any of my findings at all as it happens. Um, there have been other people who have found it difficult to find um, the gases particularly generated. There's never been much f trouble in finding the fungi. Um, and this it usually um, is the result of not following the instructions carefully enough. The Lancet research has found that PVC-covered mattresses, many of which contain antimony, are the safest available. Far from increasing the risk of babies dying, the use of that sort of mattress was associated with a significantly lower risk of cot death than the use of any other type of mattress. This study found smoking by parents is now the biggest single risk factor associated with cot death. Manufacturers like Boots, who withdrew some kinds of mattresses after the Cook report, say they're now awaiting a government inquiry into cot deaths to be published later this year. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. 
The pound took another tumble today to hit an all-time low against the Deutschmark, as did the Italian lira. The pound eventually rallied slightly to close at two Deutschmarks 19.3 pfennigs, down more than two pfennigs on the day. The fall came despite the Bundesbank president, Hans Tietmeyer, repeating that a small cut in German interest rates was now possible. Medical authorities in the earthquake-ravaged city of Kobe in Japan claim that up to 500 old people may have died because of poor conditions and inadequate care. It's two months since Japan was hit by its worst earthquake for 70 years. In Kobe, 5,000 people were killed and large areas of the city were devastated. It's taking a long time for normality to return. In the Nagata district of Kobe, a working class area of shops and small factories where fire completed the destruction the earthquake began, life and hope are rising again from the ruins. Futoshi Takata and his wife had a workshop here, making a kind of dried fish used as seasoning. He says if he waited for the city authorities to help him, it would take so long all his customers would go elsewhere. So he found two elderly carpenters and went ahead on his own. If you don't do it yourself, no one will do it for you. That's what I was taught in primary school and I've always believed it. There are other signs of normalcy returning. Trains are running again. Business is brisk, especially at groceries and food stalls. But demolition is painfully slow. Officials say it'll be a year before all the condemned buildings are down and large-scale reconstruction can begin. A grim prospect for the homeless. Today, the Rodin bronze in the foyer of the city council building here, a symbol of Kobe's days of glory, is surrounded by a squatter camp, a refuge for the dispossessed. Japan's per capita income may be among the highest in the world, but two months on, 95,000 people are still in improvised shelters like this in government offices and schools. There's no heating, they're living on junk food, and health problems are growing, especially among the elderly. The earthquake has brought into the open the income gap in Japan. The people who are dying tend to be old and poor. Some of the elderly here are starting to think it would be better to have died in the earthquake than to be living in their current state. Nine old people have died at this hospital from illnesses attributable to poor living conditions. Dr. Weda says up to 500 may have died in the city as a whole. As the months pass, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that, as so often in Japan, reviving the economy takes first place, making what's left of life a little easier for its long-suffering people come second. Philip Short, BBC News, Kobe. Nigel Mansell's full-time return to Formula One motor racing has been postponed because, according to his team McLaren, he's too big for his car. The car is now being redesigned, but Mansell will miss the first two Grand Prix of the season. McLaren are not so indelicate as to detail Nigel Mansell's vital statistics, but they're telling an incredulous public that the 1992 world champion is just a little too big for his car. In the high-tech, high-moneyed world of Formula One testing, McLaren were in Portugal earlier this month, it seemed a bizarre oversight to forget the tape measure, especially when the car and the new driver were launched with the kind of fanfare that motor racing has almost turned into an art form. Mansell, still to sit in the cockpit, was certainly impressed. You know, you look at it from the front and you think, flip. And then you look at it from the side and it's even more impressive. So, uh, and I won't tell you what the back looks like. Hopefully a lot of people will be watching that. But it's Mansell's back, not the cars, on which the McLaren design team is now obliged to focus, requiring their driver to miss two races before he can settle more comfortably into a car that caught the eye with its so-called wing, but where the demands of aerodynamic efficiency mean a narrow chassis and the fashionably new raised nose cone, which in turn obliges the driver to sit with his legs raised awkwardly upwards. When the car was designed, say McLaren, they only had the slimmer, lighter co-driver Mika Hakkinen as a model. At first, Mansell raised no objection. He had seat fittings in the factory and professed himself to be quite comfortable. And of course, uh, that is what testing is all about. He went to Estoril, tested the car, and driving a car at 200 miles an hour is sort of different than sitting in a factory doing a seat testing. So, replacement driver Mark Blundell has been slotted into the car today. Without a permanent drive this season, he won't be quite so particular if he meets the same problems as Mansell, whose famous perfectionism now seems to be in overdrive. There are currently suggestions that his personal discomfort is no more the issue than his inability to get the best out of a car that's been by no means problem-free. An interesting season lies ahead at McLaren. 
Rob Bonnet, BBC News. The prospect of an all-English final in the European Cup Winners' Cup came a step closer when Arsenal and Chelsea were kept apart in the draw for the semi-finals. Arsenal will play the Italian club Sampdoria, while Chelsea take on the Real Zaragoza of Spain. Now, rugby England and Scotland have been put through their final training paces ahead of tomorrow's championship decider at Twickenham. It's winner-take-all. At stake, the Calcutta Cup, the Triple Crown and the Grand Slam. A group of schoolboys caught a last glimpse of the England side training this morning before tomorrow's winner-takes-all match of the season. But not everyone was impressed. I, I look forward to it, sort of. But I'm, I'm going to the match tomorrow. Why only for sort of? Because I support Scotland. They need all the support they can get, being underdogs for the game at 7-2. But win or lose, this has already been a successful season for the Scots, having originally been earmarked for the wooden spoon by many two months ago. At Murrayfield in 1990, England underestimated Scotland and lost the Five Nations title. But not this time, they say. This rugby's changed a lot. and. and um... I hope that we're better prepared mentally. We've overcome one or two obstacles and challenges this year and uh, that gives us good confidence going into tomorrow's match. 60,000 fans will be at Twickenham for tomorrow's Calcutta Cup fixture. Victory for either side would also be an important boost in the run-up to the World Cup in South Africa. Clive Myrie, BBC News. And tonight's main news again. President Clinton has called on Sinn Féin and the IRA to start talking about getting rid of the weapons. And he said he and John Major shared the same goals. I'm joined now from Washington by our island correspondent, Dennis Murray. This row between Washington and London, Dennis, can Mr Adams take that much comfort from it now Mr Clinton has revealed his agenda too? Well, I think what Mr. Clinton was doing today was saying very emphatically to Jerry Adams, OK, you got your visa and OK, you can fundraise, but there's a price to be paid for that, which is you must talk seriously about decommissioning. I think certainly the temperature between London and Washington has come down this week, and what President Clinton had to say today has certainly helped in that. Do Mr. Adams and those around him show signs of realising they must go on delivering to maintain their folk hero status in the United States? Yes, I think they're very aware of that, and I think Mr. Clinton's very aware of that, which is why the president made a point today, firstly so publicly of making the point to Sinn Féin that they must be prepared seriously to make progress in the decommissioning area. And uh, secondly, I think that Sinn Féin are aware of that because if they are to fundraise here, if they need the money, then they have to keep that status. I think they're very aware of that indeed, yes. At the end of this eventful week, is it your feeling that the peace process is still very much on course? I think certainly the feeling of the Irish and the Americans is that it's very much on course. I think the British were very angry. John Major was very angry about what the Americans did. And even though the British government is discussing an agenda for a ministerial meeting with Sinn Féin, I'm told tonight by the Northern Ireland office that that does not mean that there will be a meeting or that it's imminent. They still want Gerry Adams and Sinn Féin to say they are seriously prepared to make progress and seriously discuss the decommissioning of weapons. Dennis Murray in Washington, thank you very much. There's more on Newsnight on BBC Two at 10.30 from the 9 o'clock news. Good night, keep your noses on and have a peaceful weekend. Good evening. Two teenagers have appeared before magistrates in Shropshire charged with murdering a garage cashier. The youths, aged 18 and 19, were arrested in Telford earlier this week. Alison Marsh reports. It was at 8.30 last Thursday that the shooting took place at this garage near Newport in Shropshire. The part-time attendant, John Dudell, died from a shotgun blast to the chest. He was only on duty that evening after agreeing to help out a friend. Sital Kumar, who's 19, and Mulk Raj, who's 18, were arrested after a police raid on this house in Telford on Monday. They appeared before the town's magistrates this afternoon. The brothers are jointly charged with murdering John Dudell. Sital Kumar also faces a charge of conspiring to pervert the course of justice. During the hour-long hearing, only Mr Kumar spoke to identify himself to the bench. Both men were remanded in custody. They'll appear again next Thursday. The men's brother, Vijay Kumar, who's 22 and from Wem, appeared in court later. He's also accused of conspiring to pervert the course of justice. 
Eleven animal rights protesters from Coventry Airport were arrested when they tried to stop a fox hunt in Warwickshire today. It's understood that a van load of demonstrators from the airport disrupted the hunt near Wellsbourne, damaging a Land Rover. Meanwhile, two people were arrested and released without charge at the airport for impersonating police officers. Derbyshire's police force is to spend thousands of pounds changing its officers' shirts from blue to white. The Police Federation says the exercise will cost £60,000 and believes the money could be better spent. The force has been refused a certificate of efficiency because of a lack of resources. And finally, football and in the Ensley League Division 2, Swansea City nil, Shrewsbury Town nil. And that's a result. That's all from the Midlands newsroom tonight. Have a good weekend. Good night. Starting on BBC Two shortly, a special curtain raiser for a series of short films portraying life in Russia. Tonight, meeting a six-year-old girl who begs on the streets to support her family. Good evening. We've had some pretty stormy weather across the British Isles for Red Nose Day. Just take a look at some of these gusts. At one time today, the wind on the top of Cardiff Weather Centre gusted to 95 miles an hour. And in London, the wind was up to 80 miles an hour as well. Now, those strong winds have all been circulating around this area of low pressure. During the next 24 hours or so, you'll find the isobars are going to open up, so those winds are going to moderate quite markedly. And now we've got that area of low pressure slipping up into the Norwegian Sea. So we'll still have a run of fairly cold northwesterly winds for tomorrow. So we've got, still going to see some wintry showers. In fact, we've got plenty of showers showing up on the weather radar at the moment. A couple of uh, fairly uh, hefty shower areas, so one over the Pennines, the other one just moving into East Anglia. Both of those moving out into the North Sea during the next few hours. And then central and eastern areas losing their showers. Clear skies coming in, so the chance of some pockets of frost and and uh, also some ice there to watch out for tomorrow morning. Most of the showers are going to be around these northern and western coasts and hills. The real frost tonight up in the highlands of uh, Scotland. Now tomorrow, a more wintry weather for northwestern areas, some drifting of the snow over northern hills and uh, mountains. Heavy uh, showers, hail, sleet and snow, and eventually some of uh, the heavy showers moving down across southeastern parts of the country. Things not too bad for the rugby tomorrow, but I think you'll have to wrap up warm. That blustery wind will make it feel quite cold and there could be the odd sharp shower moving through during the match. Temperatures very similar to today's although I think the wind's perhaps a little bit stronger up over Scotland tomorrow so it's likely to feel a little bit colder there but in the south perhaps not quite as cold. If anything on Sunday the winds will have more of a northerly component to them so it'll start to feel colder again perhaps even a more prolonged period of snow for Northern Ireland, for Scotland and for Northern England but in the south I think the shower is becoming fewer and and further between. And that's the forecast. Oh, be joyful. So let's take the top. Yes? Everybody ready? And one. BBC One brings you Joanna Trollope's best-selling novel, The Choir. Good. Have you had an affair with anyone? Since I married Alan, no. Well, you're about to have one now. Dark secrets and dangerous passions in the secluded world of a cathedral close. No, I just can't go any further, Leo. You must give up. No. Politics are played. There will still be considerable opposition. But you are Dean Huffo. Battles are fought. To risk robbing this cathedral of its choir after 400 years. And families divided. Where does your loyalty lie, with your grandson or your politics? But when the cathedral begins to crumble, a community is torn apart. The choir, starting Sunday at five past nine on BBC One. Saturday night on BBC One, and at five past eight, feelings run high in casualty. This is supposed to be some sort of joke. I'm missing out some hot goss. You know what gossip is, Jude? What? Getting a laugh at somebody else's expense. Oh, excuse me. At 9.15, in Willie Russell's Dancing Through the Dark, the girls and boys are out on the town. I can't help it, you see. I'm gregarious. Pleased to meet you, Greg. I'm Donna. Oh, after the kebab. Premiership action in match of the day at quarter to 11 with highlights from the day's top games. And at 11.45 in the stand-up show, comedy from Michael Redman, Bob Mills and Dominic Holland. I was thinking, why don't we see more of Dominic on television? And then I thought, no, that's how tall he is. <laughs> Saturday night on BBC One. And now on BBC One, the programme which puts the fun into fundraising with part two of Comic Relief.
Yes, the night of Comic Relief 1995. Presented by Chris Evans, Lenny Henry, Harry Enfield and Chums, Mel Smith and Griffiths Jones and Jonathan...